All right, welcome to Tuesday morning's pastor, uh, Tuesday morning pastor's corner. Um, I, I am Will Buttermore, uh, teaching elder at Beth Haven Church. I'm going to ask our participants to kind of go around this the room here and just introduce yourself. Uh, we'll go ahead and begin with uh, the uh, with Carl here, and I'll go ahead and just call you out by name, and you go ahead and give yourself an introduction. I'm I'm Carl Denty, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, retired pastor. I retired in 2022 after 45 years of ministry. Good to be with these young men again. Thank you. Eric. Eric Bush, Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, pastor of Southwood Bible Church. Um, that's it. <laughs> Drew. Uh, Drew Freeman, uh, Yukon, Oklahoma, pastor of Trinity Bible Church, uh, Oklahoma City. Excellent. Jacob? Jacob Heaton, linebacker, Chafer Theological Seminary. Just kidding. Pastor Excellent. of uh, Fellowship Bible Church in the Denver area. Excellent. Paul? Paul Miles, Executive Director of Grace Abroad Ministries, Key of Ukraine, currently displaced to Oklahoma. We appreciate you being in the States for a little while, even though it's under uh, bad circumstances. Uh, let's go ahead and go Luther. Yeah, Luther Smith, um, assistant teaching elder at uh, uh, Beth Haven Church, same fellowship that uh, that uh, Will, Will Buttermore is at. And Brad. Um, Brad Maston, pastor of Fort Collins Bible Church. So, and I had mentioned Brad last because it's his book, that booklet that we're kind of using. He wrote about, what, 10 years ago? And That's so correct. we're using, using it as kind of a launching pad for our, our, our roundtable discussion. Our discussion for this uh, particular series is going to be on masculinity. Um, I'm going to try to facilitate. I want to try to get as many opinions in as possible or thoughts, biblical analysis, so that we can over the next 10 weeks or, or less or more, or that's the kind of the goal, is to try to get as much information out there as possible so that we can uh, address um, this particular topic uh, with as much fluidity and um, as, as, as much information as possible so we can give our both our youth and our older men some understanding over the, the cultural uh, and biblical discussion on this topic. All right. So first question that I have here is, how would you define masculinity? How would you define it? Okay. Um, and, and again, there's no wrong answers. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with Jacob right there in my middle because I'm just looking right at you. I was hoping to gain some wisdom. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, I'll start with the young man in the group, actually. It's kind of, I think you're the youngest, aren't you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I think first and foremost, we have to get our definition from Scripture and what God reveals about it. And so with that, my definition is going to be very uh, probably raw and underdeveloped. I'm actually excited for this study just to kind of sharpen this, mm -hmm. but... Um, definition for biblical masculinity, I would, I would say is living under the light of what God has revealed concerning our person and our role as a man, a part of being made in the image of God. Very good. Drew, do you have a, do you have a, a definition you'd like to add to that? Uh, that that's a pretty good description of uh, uh, masculinity is actually I think doing what God called us to do and uh, you know we can look back at Adam and put in the garden and he was there to protect it and tend it and basically be a shepherd and um, you know I I think that's what it is is uh, our culture has attacked it with such a level that men don't know what it means to be men and they've uh, they've attacked it by by looking at the extremes um and i think looking at the extremes of um of uh, men being uh, jerks and the other extreme of them being panty waist i think is a mistake i think the answer is somewhere in the middle okay eric Okay. Uh, yeah. Definition of biblical masculinity. That's Just masculinity. It. I would say I would say masculinity. 
and, 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 and you could go biblical or you can go cultural. I don't, it's just, how would you define masculinity well, I, in general? First thing I don't first. think we can get a true definition of masculinity and stay outside the Bible. True. true. Okay. I mean, just uh, point in fact, that's why we're doing this. Kind yes. of thing. I, I think uh, as we look through this and develop it, the Bible doesn't give us in a concise one place what masculinity is. Um, but but I, as we look at God's design for man, in a similar fashion, we're made in his image. So I would say one of the main things we've got to look at is a, a man who can lead others to a place, a godly place that he's going. Uh, I think it comes with leadership. It, co it comes with love. It comes with a man's life, uh, the ex being an example. So all those things are involved. Um, it has nothing to do with the, what's the old adage? Uh, a beer in one hand, a cigar in the other, and a remote right in front of you. That's not 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 anything close to that. Um, you know, uh, I, I I believe as we look through the the best way to, that I've looked at men in the Bible is to look at man in the Bible, in the various aspects of what what they chose wrongly, what they admitted to, and where they led people to. I think that's that's where I'm at with those things. So. All right, Carl, like to chime in? Yeah, I'm. I'm not very far away from uh, where Jake is because I. I really think masculinity is is set for force in the Bible, and from my perspective, it's it's relatively simple, and that is that we are to live in accordance with the norms, the standards, the truths that God has set forth for us in His Word as men, and I think there are, are some general things you could say. You know, relative to that, I, I, I think a man is responsible. I think a man is a protector. I think a man is a, is a provider. I think a man is a person who is respectful of others. He, he's a person with, in, with integrity. Uh, those things, but primarily, I, I really look and I like to, I don't know who this is, yours or uh, uh, Brad. Brad. You know, it, I, like, I like the questions. I think they're well thought out questions, mm -hmm. and, and I really do think, I think you have a model. I think you can look at the life of Christ as these kind of direct, and from his life, I think you can get some good insight into what God would have us to be as men, which, as Drew says, is radically different from what we're getting from the world. I don't think, I don't think people today have any clue of what masculinity means. I think they're as confused as they could can be. Uh, and, and I think basically in, in this country, uh, not, no, that's not true. There's geographical differences. And I, I think I, there, there are. Uh, that uh, There are ge geographical differences, I think, the way we look at masculinity uh, in, in, this, in this country. Uh, but by and large, I think we have lost sight. And I think men have lost sight. Uh, I was reading an article, this is dumbfounded, and, I, and, I, and I, this one I knew. 1980, when people graduate from college, it's one to one ratio, one man, one woman. Today it's a two to one ratio, two women for every man, for yeah. graduates. Uh, men have lost uh, their direction. Uh, I, I don't think the average young man, since I'm old, I guess I need, guess I need to define what I mean by young. Uh, but I think when you start looking at, at, at men in their 20s to mid-30s today, I think they're absolutely lost as to what's expected of them, what the norm is. And I hope this will be useful uh, to help some of those young men see from a biblical foundation what God calls a man. Good. Brad, I'd like you to chime in on this one now. So um, can you give me some of your concepts or thoughts on masculinity? Especially in dealing with the, the the impetus to write your book, or like you know, um, if you did, you have a thought in mind in dealing with masculinity and the definition of it such. Yeah, well, um, one, I just really appreciate everything that has come up. It's not surprising that we'd be all on a very similar page regarding uh, regarding this issue. But I think one of the big kind of challenges in discussing biblical masculinity is that a uh, you know, a, a good man, if we're going to use that term in, in the most, you know, positive, basic term possible, not theologically, a good man, excuse me, 
is first a good person, right? I mean, there's so much that just <clears throat> so many bad men are just lousy people. They'd be lousy if they were women, right? So um, the reality that a lot of the things that we talk about, uh, you know, in terms of good biblical masculinity or a positive picture of biblical masculinity are just really basic characteristics of a person who is uh, walking with Christ, who's growing in Christ, who's becoming the person God designed us to be. So then when we get into the question of masculinity, we're looking at what are those parts or portions of our place and calling as men that differs from biblical femininity. But ultimately, most of the failures in biblical or in masculinity in general are just failures, personal failures, failures of people. Like they're just bad people, much less bad men, right? Because there's abusive men, there's abusive women, there's, you know, as again, weak-willed women and weak-willed men. There's just all those things are all possible. So as we come to this discussion, right, so much of it is just really getting on the right page with Christ and walking with Christ and growing with him to become the person you're meant to be and then learning what it means to function very specifically in our, our role as men in this time. So that was really what hit uh, me, what really caused me to write the book was um, that there was an outflow within Christianity, within the sort of pop Christianity, with a bunch of books that I won't name that were all basically kind of chest beating, grunting, burping, farting masculinity with Christian sprinkles all over it, right? So, and these were catching on like wildfire because men were feeling like they were losing their place or losing something about that. And so the sort of Clint Eastwood, John Wayne masculinity was held up as a sort of picture of what Christian masculinity should be. And uh, even when it was first put forth, I just rebelled against that so extraordinarily because I wouldn't argue that John Wayne and Clint Eastwood provide positive pictures of masculinity at all. There are certain parts of it that we could break off and say, oh, we like that. You know, we, we somehow identify with that. We like their courage or we like their protective nature, whatever it is. Uh, but ultimately, right, they're they're violent, short-tempered. They're just, they're not Christ-like pictures. They don't act like Jesus at all. And so um, that really made me realize that our pictures of masculinity are totally paganized. We just take the pagan pictures of masculinity that come to us all the way down from Greek mythology and our Achilles and our Odysseus, right? Pictures of what a, a, what a man is um, and um, wrongfully impute that and say that this is what our distinction between man and woman is. And so it's really kind of interesting to me as we come into this new world. It's a different world than I wrote this book into in that now we've uh, got such interesting discussions surrounding um, words like toxic masculinity, which I have to say is a lot of what I was shooting against in this book, right, is trying to rewrite some of these ideas about masculinity as being um, gruff, unfeeling, unwilling to show love or show sacrifice, the, the, the basically the baby that insists on always getting his way or he's going to get violent, right? Um, all of these features, you know, are now under attack. And of course, that attack has gone way over rotated. Uh, but so now we've got this whole generation, as Carl so well put out, uh, put put to the point of men who are totally emasculated, afraid to show any will whatsoever, afraid to lead, afraid to take risks, afraid to make sacrifices, afraid to get what they want because they think that that is somehow not allowed or somehow disallowed uh, because of the cultural pressure upon them. So I think this discussion is needed now more than ever, and I imagine it's going to take us to places that my book never uh, intended or, or uh, thought would happen because, again, I was mostly reacting to that perversion of modern Christianity that came about in the late nineties with all the, you know, the John Eldridge stuff and all that business. All right. Excellent. And we're going to also welcome in Poochie Jones, who is uh Poochie. Are you, are you live? Are you, are you, you're muted. You're talking. All right. He might just be a fly on the wall for us. All right. Um, thank you, Brad. Uh, Poochie Jones is up in Duluth. He's one of the, uh, uh, teaching, uh, I think, you know, teaching deacons at uh, Duluth Bible Church, um, and we will uh, hopefully have his participation in uh, coming moments as well. Uh, Luther, um, mm -hmm. would you like to chime in on the definition, of how you would define masculinity, or if there's a, a concept or a, a different bridge you'd like to approach? Yeah, I think um, I think everybody's touched on it, and 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 from their different perspectives and angles i'm i'm just kind of looking at the word itself and kind of breaking down the etymology sorry i'm i'm kind of the english word nerd here um so you know just the the 
the way that this the 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 word is formed, if you have the case ending i t y, that's speaking of the quality of a thing, or the substance of a thing, and then masculine, I mean, just the root word of it just means male. So the quality of being a male, that's just what the word masculinity means, just in toto. Now, if we add an adjective to that, um, you know, that tells us what worldview we're going to approach it from, right? So if we're talking about you know secular masculinity, you can put that particular uh, worldview into masculinity and how they would define it. I think um, uh, Brad had stated that very clear that uh, in terms of our culture today, masculinity is referred to as status, right? What what you know the the big the bigger bag that you have. You know, whether or not you can lift 300 plus pounds, you know, if you look like a Chad, you know, what I'm saying or a Tyrone, um, you know what I'm saying? You, you know, it, it's all about status, how many Bugattis you have, how many cars you drive, you know, whether or not you own a pl private jet, um, you know, that those types of things, uh, you know, you can kind of put that into the situation. I, I think that not only is that not biblical, I think it's anti um it's anti it's against scripture um you know then on the other side of the coin you have what i would call the feminist masculinity right where you know a person is only supposed to weigh 60 pounds wet you know it's it's status of but but, but of a different type you know what i'm saying and neither one of those uh uh fit what masculinity is from a biblical standpoint if we're looking at it scripturally for one, masculinity has to do with one's biology too. You know what I'm saying? That that we have parts that women don't, and that's what makes us masculine. The, the 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 our chemistry is different from a female. That's what makes us masculine. Um um, you know, uh, the way that you know th that we're stronger than women physically. You know, I know that some people don't like that, but that's what it is. Um, you know, that's what makes us masculine. And I would underscore Brad's uh, 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 point that character um, underscores this particular quality as well. I find it very fascinating, too, that um, when it comes to scripture and how we are to conduct ourselves for, with one another, there really is no difference. Um, you know what I'm saying? We're to honor and love and care and 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 connect with each other, right? We're to protect and 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 love one another. Um, um, you know, I just find it to be very fascinating. So I, I think that 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 masculinity, if we're just looking at the word itself, it's speaking of the substance and nature of who we are as as men, not just biologically as well but also, you know, our function and role in society. And I think both cultures, they, they've got it completely wrong. They've got it, they've got it backwards because they're not starting from the premise that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Um, so. That's very, I like that. Um, and, and Carl fouled out, but he's back. All right. So connection problems, Paul, um, you want to give a, 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 your kind of thoughts on masculinity, what it is, Luther, Luther just said everything I wanted to say, but maybe a little bit more eloquent. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, whenever I, I deal with a topic like this, I always try to do more of an, uh, a linguistic etymological approach. When you say, what is biblical masculinity? Well, if it ain't in the strongest concordance, <laughs> then we don't need to define it uh, as it is used in the context of scripture because it is not used within scriptural context. And so we need to discuss what the idea is that we're trying to describe through uh, biblical lenses. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, and, and I and, do uh, appreciate to, the to do that. We can look at examples. Of yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, you, you kind of broke up there. I thought you were done. Um, oh, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so on, on those kind of points, Poochie, um, I introduced you a little bit. If you want to go ahead and just introduce yourself, we just do name where you are and kind of your position within ministry. You're muted. How about, how about that? Can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Uh, Poochie Jones from Duluth, Minnesota, part of Duluth Bible Church. Um, deacon, song leader, worship leader, small group leader, 
um, teach about two or three times a month, um, mostly focusing on second tense. I love talking about how to walk in the newness of life. And so, yeah, that's kind of my role here and do some Excellent. counseling, stuff like that. Perfect. You, uh, do you want to kind of like chime in on this? Do you want to define or kind of like what, what would you, how would you define masculinity just in general? I, I kind of like some of the things that Luther had to say about how it's mis, how it's uh, packaged around the things we do uh, have. Um, so yeah, I think biblical biblical masculinity deals with the character and the role, uh, the assignments of things, uh, stewardship, those things. So yeah, I I would say it, it needs to be. We need to expose how we think incorrectly about it before we probably build what it is biblically because we have a lot of wrong uh, presuppositions about what it is but i think it deals with mainly character and and those roles that we have excellent um just to let you know from this point forward um i wanted to kind of get everyone's kind of a, uh, thoughts on this but from this point forward it's kind of going i'm just going to ask a question whoever wants to answer feel free to answer um if i if i want to go ahead and pick on somebody i'll go ahead and i'll call them out but um Basically, it's whoever wants to answer from this point forward. But I'm going to go ahead and start with this question here, because if we're talking about this, it's because there's there's something out there that has either infiltrated the, the, the churches or is on the outskirts of the churches that are starting to influence young men minds or or even within the, 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 the women of mothers, families, concepts within our theology books, within within the pulpits. So we have to start with kind of like at times we re, we're responding to situations. We're not always on the forefront. We're not, we're not, we're not blazing the trail. We're kind of going behind it and kind of trying to fix what was, what was broken. So let me ask, let's begin with this, just from our cultural concepts and standpoint, is there toxic masculinity? This has been thrown around for the last, you know, what, 15 years now about a toxic masculinity. Is this, true is this a reality within our culture well i i think i alluded to this before but just to get the ball rolling absolutely is there toxic femininity is there toxic humanity i mean if we're talking about toxic as being destructive or hurtful we can't argue that there's not right abusive i mean that uh sort of uh, rape culture, the abundance of pornography in this world just attests to the fact that there is abusive and toxic masculinity, and it's rampant, right? Uh, certainly, I think it's overplayed and 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 is being used as a tool uh, of the enemy to tear down positive views and pictures and ideas of masculinity. So I'm not suggesting that everything, everyone that uses that phrase is, um, you know, is 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 correct or biblically thinking. But I think we have to recognize that anything apart from God, anything apart from growth in Christ is going to manifest itself as toxic, as destructive, and that includes masculine tendencies and feminine tendencies. So mm -hmm. that's how I would put that. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that because there because a lot of people talk about toxic masculinity. What about toxic femininity? There's a lot of things that are that 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 the 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 female um norms go to an extreme and it kind of can destroy families and um, and societies in various different ways as well. Um, does anyone else want to answer that kind of question? Do, is there a toxic masculinity? Is it overblown? Is it is it is it? Do we do we understand what it is? I, if you if you I, want to kind of go and say what is to toxic masculinity, we can even start with that question there. See the, the 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 problem with this particular phrase is that it carries with it presuppositions from another perspective. You know what I'm saying? That that whenever we talk about toxic masculinity, whether we agree with it or not, we are we are essentially inviting um um I I would I would be convinced we are inviting a, a, a worldview that is alternative, that is an alternative or an alternative narrative to the ones that we would particularly promote. I, I appreciate Brad's statement of toxic humanity. Toxic masculinity and toxic femininity really is just sin. That's really what it is. I mean, you know, I mean, if you know, um, but again, we're we're looking at it from a biblical position. Another person who's looking at it from a radical feminist position would have no problems using toxic masculinity because their presupposition is is that women are are, are always the victims, irrespective of what happens, right? Whereas 
whereas men uh, or masculinity is a concept that has dominated uh, women um, over, you know, this is kind of the concept of the patriarchy, right? Um, you know, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I, I I do agree that um, that we ought to address these matters and that we ought to, uh, uh, just like Brad said, um, um, to to speak out when these things happen, right? Um, but I do, I don't, I think that adopting particularly this phrase could be a bit problematic because it assumes that um, that if I, it assumes the subjective nature of a person and their actions. If, 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 if I am very passionate about speaking or if I get very frustrated about a particular thing and that person has this ideology, they may view me as having toxic masculine traits when that might not be the case because they're working from this position. I agree with that on absolutely. Jacob, give your hand. Yeah, I think Luther, that's a perfect segue to what I wanted to say is that the difficulty with having any discussion on a topic that kind of is across all social boundaries like masculinity, femininity, femininity, <laughs> easy for me to say, those sort of things is that it all comes from a certain place that is their worldview. And so we can have these discussions and try to educate people on what biblical masculinity is. But, you know, I think what has been discussed already and, and I think needs to be emphasized is it all comes from that source of how do you see the world and how do you filter information? How do you filter uh, these types of issues? And that is, I think, where the work most needs to be done. And so I say this, I guess, for the benefit of a person who may be listening to this and genuinely wants to know that you're kind of going to be caught in a war between ideas and worldviews as you're thinking about, well, what is a man? You know, you're going to hear this person who's probably more eloquent than uh, I could ever say and very persuasive in their speech. And you can become convinced that, oh, that must be a man. Uh, they have a large following and a man is a leader. So that person must be the perfect textbook uh, quintessential man. And so I guess that's just something I think that's important to emphasize is the battle behind the battle is a battle of worldview. What, how would you, I, I'm not defined, but what are the characteristics of basically a destructive male attributes? Now go ahead, I mean, Carl, go ahead, Drew. I can't figure out how to put a little hand up on the window <laughs> here. <laughs> I'm still looking for the little, <laughs> so the uh, <clears throat> part of what's called toxic masculinity has all been uh, redefined, which is typical of the way that the uh, liberals, the left, however you want to call it, that's typical of how they work. Now, is there a toxic masculinity? Yes. Is it applied correctly? Uh seldom i think from those outside of our worldview but we have to take a look and ask what what makes that and i i look at the four major temptations of man which is fame fortune power and pleasure and toxic masculinity is one where fame is taken to a self-centered self-righteous level where fortune that I'm masculine because I have all this money like Luther talked about earlier. Power, I think, is where a lot of it comes to because, you know, God established authority authority in the man in the household, but he didn't establish it to be a dictator or an authoritarian. He established it to be a servant. And I think it can be overused. I've seen it overused in multiple countries around the world where women are no more than than servants i mean that's that's all they are and i saw uh, next to a lake one time in in india there was a woman walking in front of three men and i thought what are they doing this is not right she was looking for snakes they put her in the front so if she got snake bit they'd know to take another and that's the type of thing that really is a toxic masculinity i think but 
Christians aren't supposed to be that way. We go back and we go, we got all the fame we need. You know, we're believers in Christ and we've, all those things are meant for us. So I, I think it's uh, toxic means deadly. It's going to kill us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think men need to step up and be the leaders they're called to be, but be this. We lost your audio. Shut your audio off. We want to lead like Christ, then he has, he has, he was a, he was the true servant. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. So that's how I think we're called to lead. And I'll shut um, up because I can talk for days. <laughs> uh, there, I, I was, I was online and, and kind of looking for like, how does the world kind of define toxic masculinity? And, and they had to kind of three things or three characteristics, not definition, but suppressing emotion hardness or over overly hard or thick skinned and violence is power. Um, now, obviously we could all agree. I think I don't have to sit there and speak for everyone, but violence is power is obviously something we would all reject. Um, that might makes right that type of concepts, you know, and whoever is the strongest wins. And, and we all know that that's an incorrect un evaluation of any type of e biblical or otherwise of masculinity. But I was kind of, a uh, I was kind of, curious as to your thoughts on this concept of teaching boys to be men and a lot of times we use phrases like man up i mean i have a two and a half year old grandson right now and i i, I didn't raise boys i raised girls which it's kind of strange because i use this type of language even with my daughters that you're you there's no reason to be overly emotional there's no reason to be controlled by your emotions if you're crying over something silly like stop it you know it's like it, there's there there is a a, a sense of teaching people to not be driven by your emotions or be overly emotional or, or make decisions emotionally. But these phrases of manning up or men don't cry, suppressing that emotion concept, has our culture, even in a well-intended concept, not a destructive concept, taken that too far? Is this something that we, that it, that is a problem or is this kind of one of the things that's kind of taken to an extreme in the, in, in the kind of the evaluation of our, of, of the culture. That's a hard call, Will, because it, when, when something um, tragically happens, somebody's got to get hold of their emotions. I mean, first, you first responders, you know, first responders, they, they need to process their emotions, but they can't do it on the scene. Okay. And I think that's part of the, the male, the man being the head of the house manning up. I think that's what it meant. And they can, they can confront difficulties and process it later. It's kind of, I, kind of what I'm seeing there. I, I think when it comes to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Brad. You're far more qualified to talk on this than I am. But at the same time, it just, I think our, our culture has a very difficult, uh, missed relationship between feelings, between our intellect, and between the truth. And so now that we have decided as a culture, uh, maybe from a previous generation that totally denied and kind of stuffed down their feelings. You know, we got went through that Sesame Street 1960s generation that then deified the feelings to the point where people wrongfully believe that your feelings are an instrument to delineate or find truth, which we know is absolutely not the case. And so as uh, Drew so well pointed out, we're looking for a control of our emotions, not being controlled by emotions, but also being available and in touch with our emotions and be able to recognize, yes, I feel sad. I feel so, I feel frightened. I feel whatever it is. Right. And so if we're looking for um, a definition of, of, of unhealthy, if maybe we'd like rather than toxic, unhealthy masculinity is shut off to its emotions, right? There is an absolute person and it's probably in all of our churches, if it's not us, that is so not able to access their emotions and understand and sympathize with or empathize with the emotions of others that they're not human. They're just robots. They're sad kind of pathetic shells of humanity because they've cut off from themselves out of fear or insecurity, the ability to interact with the fact that they have 
feelings. They have emotions in a correct relationship with their intellect and their will and the rest of their humanity. So um, I would say that there is something to be said for that problem. But as has been so well pointed out, our culture has whiplashed so far the other way expressly because it's so much easier to manipulate a person's emotions than it is to manipulate the truth or their feet, you know, their, their, their understanding of the facts. So uh, whether this is advertising or government control, right, it's far easier if you've told people to deify their emotions, their fifis, that they're going, that you can control them because you can always make someone feel a certain way just by showing them a picture of a dead puppy, right? You're going to make them feel a certain way regardless of the facts. Now, thinking, making a person think or reason is a whole different thing. So, um, so I think that's the the difficult path that we tread, right? In in this discussion, is how do we become truly, you know, actualized human beings who, in 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 accordance with God's design of us, are aware of and interact with our emotional emotional state, as well as uh, recognizing that that is not the thing that either uh, you know separates truth from fiction or. Uh, sets our direction in life, right? And I think that's a, a key feature of masculinity, as Drusa will pointed out, that uh, we are meant to be able to separate our emotions from the facts of the situation and do what needs to be done in spite of the fact that it might cause us to feel a certain way. And I think that's why God put men in charge of a church and families and, and so on and so forth. I think, I think when it comes... I'm sorry. I'm I think when it comes to this, there there ought to be some nuance um, within this particular because this is all this is kind of multi layered, multifaceted. We're kind of looking at several different things all at once. I think when it comes to emotions and stuff like that, we also we have to look at the vocation of an individual. Drew, you had mentioned first responders and things like that. I I would expect them to not deal so much in their emotions when a crisis hits because that's what they're trained to do right they're they're trained to put their emotions aside and 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 focus on the task at hand which is the crisis right to to, to deal with that in one sense or or another i think as 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 pastors as us as pastors are concerned i think that we there needs to be a tightrope on both sides that that you know when a person is coming to us to you know, because someone just died or, you know, and, and it was unexpected, you know what I'm saying? I think we should weep with them. I think scripture is very clear on that, you know what I'm saying? And and be present with them, you know, rather than just give them, you know, the the the, the go-to verse, you know what I'm saying, to, to, to encourage them. I think we should, we should cry alongside of them before we encourage them and comfort them. It gives them a space to do that in terms of being a father and stuff like that i think it's it depends on the context right um you know if you know if my teenage daughter just got broken up with the with with a boyfriend right to me i'm like you know that's just life yeah you know i'm saying it's time to get over it but for her yeah, that's yeah. a devastating <laughs> thing you know what I'm saying? And so to be present with her in that and go, you know, honey, I, I understand this is just what happens. You know, I, I, I totally get it. You know what I'm saying? And and I just want you to know, I really care about, you know, your relationships and your things like that, you know, versus you know, just going, you know what, you know, don't worry about it. It's cool. Just, you know, a, a big deal. So I think I think that that in terms of just this particular topic, us being emotional, um, I think you're right, Brad, once again, that I think the pendulum has swung both ways. And I think it's because because of collectively the culture, again, is not biblical in its thinking. I mean, we see David. David was a strong man. David was a tough guy. David was was the man. He was a warrior. But then we see him crying and weeping over here. We read Psalms, you know, where he's just, you know, it's like, dude, get a couple of tissues. The, the, you know what I'm saying? Um, he's very, very focused in his emotional state and i think that's because of the perspective that he has that he serves the god of it the god of israel and and he has wisdom in that regard so i think there's just there ought to be some nuance when we're talking about this eric um i i just i want to address something in, in brad's book i guess that's what we're supposed to be using part of the bouncing point 
Um, or it's balancing point, not just we're not just following it directly, but yeah. Oh, no, I know that. Um, but I think it's interesting because I'm listening to everybody develop their the viewpoint we're trying to follow. And I think we're dealing with a duality going on. We're trying to develop a biblical perspective, but most of us live in different worlds. For instance, Brad says, how do you how do we choose a picture of what true and real masculinity means? Well, that's the next so, question. Uh, well, <laughs> no, no, because I, I sorry. <laughs> this is the way I'm going. So hang on. Um so we're dealing with two different factors. We're we really want to be biblical. But we live in the real world. And if we lived a thousand years ago, our viewpoints would be entirely different. If we lived in the times of the Bible, um, our viewpoint would be obviously somewhat different. And just in this you know, uh, set of nine guys, I bet you our, our viewpoints from that question is somewhat different. What is our father like? What, what was our examples in the sports realm or the theater or whatever it was? that was developed from and i'm going from the solid stuff not the garbage that's going on today there there was some solid stuff i mean we we all wanted to walk like or talk like john wayne you know we we wanted to hit somebody as hard as uh dirk Navisky or or uh some you know mike singletary you know we, we wanted to be the guy that everybody would depend on that would walk away with the trophy and not the little plastic participation thing you know um so when we look at what we say, what what being a man is, um, I think sometimes we tend to look at who was who was the king, who who won the trophy, who passed the test, instead of looking at what got them there. How did they arrive at that? How did Daniel become Daniel? You know, how did how did Joseph um, deal with the wonderful family he was <laughs> cast into, kind of thing. <laughs> So, so I th I think we're, we're trying to develop a, a one a concise answer to this when it's more of a how did you develop that how did you develop the picture you choose as masculinity today versus what you should be developing is the picture of what God's word says man up kind of thing uh, and I think that's where I'm kind of looking at the process not over oh, there. Here's a test you could take, and you are the man, kind of thing. So um, that's kind of what my thoughts were going on with that. So, right. Jacob, I I wanted to just briefly touch on emotions because of what Brad and Luther were saying, and I agree. I think society not operating from a biblical worldview is inevitably going to go on this pendulum swing uh, by generation, and I think with that pendulum swing we even as Bible-based believers can get swept up in that. And I've even sensed within our own movement, people being very shut off to emotions. And I, I don't think that's biblical either. Now, I, I absolutely agree with the general sentiment that they are a poor uh, tool to make determinations, those sort of things. But being made in the image of God, emotions are a part of that. And I believe that emotions are communicative they are communicating something we just don't base everything off of them but we should consider them and so i think our role as biblical males needs to first learn this for ourselves and this goes back to earlier what brad was saying but i think with helping a child process emotions there's at least three things i think we should do is one identify what emotion are you feeling Help them contextualize it because a child doesn't know. They just feel. And so if we can help them contextualize, okay, why did you feel this way? What did, how did this make you feel? Why uh, is the circumstance happening to you? And then help them to process it biblically. And I think, you know, I've even as a dad of boys fallen into some of those, maybe not as healthy. I don't see a wrong, I don't see an issue with just simply saying man up. But at the same time, am I harming my kids by glossing over maybe a legitimate thing that I need to help them process because they don't know how? And so I just a lot of uh, stimulating thoughts that I had from you guys. It sounds like some of your kids need to man up right now. Um, no, I think, I think they are <laughs> killing each other in the background. Case in point. <laughs>
I wanted to piggyback on what you said, uh, Jacob. Um, um, I counseling um, individuals over the years, I have learned something that usually um, when it comes to men and having them process their emotions, they're not, we're not very good at it. Um, as a matter of fact, I would say that out of all the, all of the men that I've counseled, I would say that, that men in their feeling vocabulary have about three and, 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 um, um, you know, that, that that because we assume that women are to all be emotional and that men aren't and because of that you know because of all of the obligations and the responsibilities that we have as men i believe some of those obligations i even even i would even submit to yourself induced um we tend to stuff down those things so we don't think about feeling words we don't think about uh, you know states of being we don't we, we, we don't have time right to do that and i think that as you mentioned jacob i believe that's part of the issue of why we see this quote unquote toxicity right is because men don't have a place where they can express their emotions they're not they're told that their emotions are bad they're told that they're negative. They're told that they're not, they're supposed to be stoic all the time. That's unrealistic. And, and again, I think that comes from, again, an improper perception of how men are supposed to be, right? I'm, I'm curious, um, Paul, um, in your travels, obviously in Europe and missionary work, do you what, what do you see as the difference in kind of the masculine nature of our culture versus Ukrainian culture, Russian culture. Is it all around the same? Is there is is the is the is the destructive nature of men different here than what you saw over there? How would you describe it? The uh, the number one product that America exports is culture. So whatever we have going on here, uh, whatever you see on television here is going to work its way into uh, other venues uh, around the world, right? Uh, which is something I've always thought is uh, fascinating, even in the in the United States, right? So you have a uh, pastor who stands and delivers a monologue, uh, which is the weakest form of instruction. And he does so once a week. And then after that, the, the congregation goes home and then they can turn on a show like uh, Modern Family, and watch as a uh, group of families that are all related, all resolve their individual conflicts, and the most functional of which is a homosexual, a homosexual pair, right? Or uh, we go back and we start watching movies and, you know, I mean, goodness, I'm from a generation where masculinity was defined by the movie uh, Fight Club, which is based on a book written by a homosexual, right? So it, it it's fascinating how we're allowing... Uh, People who are, are justifying very uh, basic improper relationships between man and woman, redefining it to be man and man, to be the the authorities for defining uh, masculinity, right? Whatever is happening in American Hollywood, that's going to happen all over the place. But uh, getting more to the point of uh, how things are looking, uh, particularly in, in Ukraine, whenever it comes to masculinity, uh, I, I think a universal uh, a function of man as opposed to woman, as opposed to boy. I, I kind of see this as quadrants, right? Male or man is male as opposed to female. Man is mature as opposed to immature. It's not a boy. It's not a woman. It's not a girl. A uniform, universal function of man, which we should all be able to uh, recognize as it is a, uh, a divine institution would be that one man should marry one woman. Uh, However, whenever you go around U Ukraine, uh, what I'm seeing is that that's not a divine institution that is being upheld. Instead, it is the uh, the hookup culture. It's the uh, a man and a woman. If they decide to go the one man, one woman route, it is typically going to be outside the bounds of marriage, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you'll typically have pregnancies and abortions before uh, eventually deciding to tie the knot if you ever even get around to that. 
so it, it really uh, it, it tears apart the fabric of society. Uh, once you mess up this idea of marriage, you start messing up the idea of family. Now you got boys being raised without a uh, mother, father in a marriage uh, to the exclusion of everyone else kind of relationship. That messes with a generation of men, right? And then they come up in this and it just uh, compounds and gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, so I'd say that's that's probably very similar to what uh, y'all are seeing in your congregations around the United States, if, if mm -hmm. I was to guess. So, Yeah, it, it is a sad state of affairs in which um, we have to train our young men to not just seek out pleasure. And and yeah. and that hookup culture is definitely within not only within our culture in America, but it's definitely it's it's also infiltrated into the churches in which it's no longer a shock that we find you know pregnancies out of wedlock. It's now it's now like yeah, it's what we expect almost. And so um, that is as a sad thing. Um, I, I, just to kind of move this along a little bit, uh, we're we're just about out of time, and you know I I wanted to get beyond just the cultural concept obviously we need to start from somewhere and obviously next week specifically we'll get into a lot more of the biblical questions and dealing with a masculinity but i, I do want to i did want to be able to define the problem has society has our cultures throughout the united states western world and throughout the rest of the world defined or identified a problem or has the problem always existed and it's like, you know, and, and, and the solution's always been there. It's like, like all of a sudden, now, all of a sudden, now we're defining the problem. I think the uh, person, I think the problem has always been there, even from the earliest stages. Go ahead, Pucci. Yeah, I was just going to mention the fact that, and I think Eric touched on this word, duality. There is the duality from scripture, from Genesis in the garden, that God said is good, but we can make it bad. And that has to be the kind of the filter for gender roles all those things so anything that we could see as good doesn't need to be demonized because it's bad it needs to be redefined as well what has got what was god's original intention of this and now let's discuss the nuance of the process of doing this so we've had to do a lot of re-education of terms at our church because people tend to not get things and so I would say there's this duality and then there's this need for definition of how do these things look and how do we put them out? Oh, agreed. Brad? Um, <clears throat> Genesis 3, 16 says, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. You shall desire, your your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Um, this problem is part of the fall. This has been going on. The battle of the sexes began at the fall. In fact, I'd argue it, it began <laughs> uh, at the very beginning when Adam throws Eve under the bus rather than taking responsibility like we would say a man should and standing up for her. He says, well, it's this woman you put me here and also put, put you know, putting uh, blame off on God. I mean, it's really not a great uh, beginning for us to set, right? That he who is supposed to care for, protect, look after, and and lead by loving and serving uh, instead uses her as a crash test dummy. No, you go ahead and try the apple first. You go ahead and try the fruit first. And then uh, when nothing happens to her, at least immediate that he could see, he tries it. Uh, and then going on forward, right, says basically throws her in, under the bus before God. So you've got kind of a background for distrust or mistrust already there. And then built into this curse of God, uh, the sense that there will be this struggle for women to be in control. It's funny, uh, as you as you think about Jeffrey Chaucer writing, you know, The Wife of Bath's Tale, essentially even, you know, all the way back then said what women really want to, to, to spoil the story. What women really want is full and final control. And that's what men really want too, right? I mean, that is part of our sin nature. We don't want to serve. We want to be served. We don't want to subjugate our desires. We want our desires to come first. We want things to go the way we think they should go, right? So in my mind, um, this is, as Luther so eloquently already put, and many others, uh, this is a sin problem. And um, while other cultures fall into the more natural gender roles as they happen biologically and then benefit from that, I would look to uh, cultures like uh, Korea and Japan that not without their problems don't have as many problems currently. Those are just cultures that I'm a little bit more familiar with uh, because 
they're operating within what we might call traditional gender roles. Again, to with with problems as well. I'm not suggesting that these are the the be all end all, um, but uh, their their cultures do uh, experience a certain amount of security and peace. And even interestingly, where gender roles are more uh, culturally input and sustained, you have a greater chance of safety walking down the street, whereas where we have destroyed those ideas of traditional masculinity, just purely culturally, uh, in, in our world, it's unsafe to walk down many American streets. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason, but I do think that taking the dignity away from masculinity is degraded many, especially unbelieving people, to the point where they go, well, if that's what it's worth, if that's all it's worth, then you know, I'm going to become a scoundrel. So I think it's always been with us. Um, well, is it, but, well, to that point too, I think you turn to the next chapter and you see it with Cain, you see it with Lamech as far as, and this goes to what Luther said earlier about the importance of us living under that concept of fear of the Lord. Well, the contrast to that, I think is depicted in Lamech who, you know, boasts in killing a man for wounding him, even a young man for hurting me, and then declaring that if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, Lamech 77 fold, he, he puts himself on the throne. He puts himself as sovereign. And I think the, that's a perfect depiction of unbiblical masculinity is, isn't that essentially what it is? Might is right. What I want is what I want and I will get. Yeah. And if, if that's not your mindset, you're not a man. <laughs> Yeah. If, if you're, if you're not, if you're not wanting control, if you're not wanting power, you're not a man. And, and obviously, you know, that's where it comes down to it. Right. That they, that I think the, the biggest issue when it comes down to defining masculinity is when we try to define it culturally. Uh, I think we can look at biology as Luther stated earlier and look at the fact we're built different. We have different uh, hormones, body structure, parts, we have we there is a general concept of how we think differently than women that's been proven okay so there between masculinity and femininity there are major differences and i we and so we can look at biology which a lot of the times people are doing now because they don't want to turn biblically culturally is it's 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 a mess so biology is where they go but that's a mistake too because obviously we're done, we're not just biological but we are immaterial and so this is where, you know, the the concept of the biblical structure has to be the, the basis for how we're going to truly define and answer the questions that people have about what is the responsibilities and the roles for an adult human male. What is that? And how is that different than females? Because we can all we talk about responsibility. Everyone should take responsibility, male or female. When we talk about integrity, everyone should have integrity, male or female. So a lot of times we we put onto the males a higher response, a higher um, standard than the females when it comes down to responsibility, integrity, hard work, that type of stuff. But what we really, I think, we need to get to is the the biblical mandates and the biblical examples for what men should take on versus what a female should take on and not that there won't be crossover right but at the same time there needs to be a, a proper define and that's what we're going to get to next week so then so we'll get to the second half of chapter one but we'll obviously get into chapter two and the questions and answers and start to really kind of dig into the concepts of what it does mean biblically to be a man all right um Carl, um, I, I, you, I, 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 you're, you're very, I, I see you're, you're, you're paying strict attention here, but I want to kind of allow you to kind of uh, chime in here and give you, give us any thoughts on the, on the discussion we've had so far and kind of give you the last word before we close. I would just ask you to change some <clears throat> terminology. I, I do not like the terminology toxic masculinity. I prefer unhealthy masculinity because I think there is, I think we're just, have meaning. Yeah. There is a, there's a strong difference in my mind between toxic and unhealthy. I agree with you 100%. Um, we use the phrase because that's what's used out there, but I agree from this point forward. I would not use, I don't use the term toxic masculinity when I talk to people about this. I use 
there's there's things that are destructive that males do. Uh, I think but we, especially I think, when you but I think we do have to you know take hold of of language and words uh, mm -hmm. with people. I don't like the fact basically what I have found the church has done, and I'm a little older than most of you guys, but but pretty much we conform to the world rather rapidly. We kind of inhale what the world takes and we just exhale it uh, back out. Uh, and with, with particularly with this subject of masculinity, uh, I, I think we're I think we're on much better ground to state that what we're looking for is healthy masculinity, which only can be developed from a biblical perspective. We live in toxic, I don't like toxic, we live in a toxic environment. The whole world is toxic. It's toxic because of sin. Mm -hmm. And what we are prayerfully are looking to, I hope, it, it, and I think this is a terrific subject, uh, particularly because of young men today. I think these guys are really taking on a, a great subject because young men today need a firm, found, biblical foundation upon, upon which to build their lives. They're not, they're not going to get it from the world, fellas. They're going to have to get it. You, well, I'll, I'll start with answer one of the questions from, from next week. How do you choose what it means to, 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 to for real masculinity? Where do you go? Well, you go to the scripture first. That's the first place I go. Eric somewhat talked about it. I look at my examples. I looked, I looked at, from my perspective, now I'm older, but I, I look for older, older men. Who, who had biblical foundation, had a basis of scripture. I looked to their example. Uh, I looked to their, their counsel. Uh, I actually and looked to the counsel of, of other men, my, my own age at, at, at that time, that were biblical. We have to be able to communicate one to another, particularly as men. We're horrible. Women are, women are much better communicators than men. I don't, I'll never understand why God made... Uh, Men pastors, since women communicate so much better <laughs> than we men. <laughs> we do need to learn to communicate to our young men and, and and to one another why this is such an important issue and where you're going to get your answers, and so they can learn to look to other to other believers. They can have confidence in other men and learn from them. Learn from them. That's Excellent. kind of I really enjoy listening to you fellas. I'm I'm so nice to be back again. It's just yeah. Delightful. We're glad you're back. We're we're very thankful for you. Uh, and uh just um, to kind of go ahead. Hold on. Well, I'd like to offer an objection uh to to the topic. Um uh Brad, don't you ever uh diss Sesame Street. <laughs> I grew up on Sesame Street, bro. The old school classics, man, are, are great. I grew up a Sesame Street kid, man. Don't you ever don't you ever diss Sesame Street? <laughs> well, I'll always love the count. So uh, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yes. Although he can only count to twelve for some reason. Yeah. I don't know what happened. <laughs> All right. Um, I would like to thank everyone for participating in this uh, Tuesday morning pastor's corner into the topic of the masculinity. And for everyone who's been watching this, I appreciate you paying attention. If you have any questions, obviously, hopefully, you know, at least one of the individuals in this room and then feel free to contact us for anything that you have questions on this and there'll be more to come. Thank you all very much and God bless.